computer you could use in real time, and it was connected to a machine to make parts. So that happened in 1952. That's not the revolution we're here for today. From that machine, there are maybe 20 machines now you can control with a computer to make things. You can burn, cut, mill, turn, print, mold, cast, about 20 or so processes today. Um, this is where it's heading. Uh, this is from, if you're familiar with it, the um, science fiction show Star Trek. This is the replicator, where you push a button and anything comes out from it by assembling the parts. The research behind Fab Labs is aiming to create that. And it's aiming to create it not by making the design digital, but by actually making the object digital. What we're learning how to do is put codes and programs into the materials themselves, actually program physical objects with digital materials. That's the scientific revolution. We're learning how to program reality by putting codes into materials. And we're getting there in stages. The first stage is a computer controlling emission, and that started in 1952. Today, we're starting to use machines to make machines, and you'll hear about that later today. Then we're starting to put codes into materials, and then finally programs into materials. And the end result is digital fabrication, programming nature. So that's the research. Now let's look at it in history. There were mainframe computers for big companies. Then there were mini computers. Then hobbyist computers. Then personal computers. That's the history we're now creating. There's the big machines like MIT made in 1952. There's the fab labs you'll hear about today. There's the machines that make machines. And then eventually there's the personal fabricator, the replicator. We're recreating the history of the digital revolution in communication and computation, but we're now making that revolution in fabrication. And those line up very closely. And that alignment has a very important lesson. Uh, this is one of my favorite pictures. This is the birth of the internet. The internet was invented on mini computers. Uh, mini computers, like the digital PDP, cost about $100,000, which was a lot for one person, but it was smaller than a whole corporation. It means a group of people could have one of them. And they were hard to use. It wasn't one machine. It was many different machines you had to connect. Um, but with it, you could invent modern technology. And so on mini computers, uh, video games, word processing, email, all of that was invented. And this is what the people who did it looked like. These were the people who actually invented the internet. What you're looking at is the first internet processing host the first site connected to the internet. So that's what the machine looked like, and that's what the people looked like. So now, today, this is what they look like. Uh, the fab labs that today's meeting about are about the cost and complexity of a mini computer. So the technology is evolving. Eventually, all the machines in a fab lab will fit in your pocket and reassemble atoms. But that's a little ways away. But with those machines, you don't need to wait. You didn't have to wait to invent the internet for the smartphone. That was done 20 years ago. So fab labs have about the same cost and complexity of a mini computer. And like the mini computer, it means you can use them to create modern technology. And so these are what the fab labs look like. Now, the way this started is the National Science Foundation in the U.S. asked us to do an outreach project. On campus, we had all of the research machines, and in 20 years, we'll make the assembler. And the idea was to, instead of telling people about the machines, let them use one. And so we set up just one lab. And in that lab, we put a range of machines big and small, to add and remove material and program materials and make circuits. Um, these are examples of things you can make with all of those machines. You can really create modern technology with all of that stuff. 
Uh, and you'll hear about many of these processes today. And our grand project was we made one of these. Um, this is what happened. There are about 200 now, and they're doubling every year and a half. That was not our project. We set up one, and then somebody in inner city Boston, and then there was a connection to Ghana and Sekundi Kamparadi, and they wanted one, and then there was a connection to South Africa and to India, and every time we opened one, it led to more. And so now every about year and a half, they're doubling. There's a few hundred at the labs, and they all have those same tools, so people and projects are shared, and they don't stay still. The technology keeps evolving, but in a way that lets people and project be shared across the network. So that's the Fab Lab network. And as it's grown, I thought the research was hard. In many ways, that's easy. That's coming along just fine. What's hard is the organization. If these tools let anybody make anything, it really turns on its side the division of aid, education, industry, all of those kind of come together. And so the Fab Lab Network has spun off businesses where you can ship data and make products. It's created educational programs where the whole planet becomes a campus. It's created platforms for aid where instead of giving solutions, you give tools to solve problems. And had to create all these new kinds of organizations to keep up with the technology. Uh, it's had a very interesting interplay with how government functions. This is legislation we'll discuss later today in the US to take the fab lab to make a new national lab out of connecting a local lab, viewing these as part of the infrastructure of a country. And so what this means is the science exactly lines up. You understand digital computing, you understand digital communication, now digital fabrication is coming. The science is looked, lines up, and the revolutions line up. Mainframes, mini computers, hobbyist computers, PCs, now we're living through machine tools for fabrication, fab labs, uh, uh, leading to personal fabricators. And what's happening around us today is this is a moment in time, just like the birth of the internet. The people at the Fab 9 meeting in effect are creating an internet of physical things. And they're asking and answering the question, if anybody can make anything anywhere, how do you live, work, and play? How does society function if anybody can make anything, if that's no longer a scarce resource? That's not a story for the future, it's here today, and it changes just about everything. So through the day today, we'll be telling the story of what does the world look like if anybody can make anything. And then through the meeting, uh, through all the colleagues here, we invite you to meet exploring that future. Okay? So the talks to come will give you different snapshots of what that future uh, looked like. And so with that, uh, let me first pause to thank um, uh, Hirosan and his colleagues, uh, KO, the city of Yokohama, the sponsors. We've been hosted so wonderfully here in every possible way. So I'd like to recognize our hosts. And thank you for bringing the world to Yokohama. And now I'm going to hand off, I'm going to be followed by uh, Abu and Choi, who are going to give you a tour of what these fab labs look like around the world. So, thank you.